great to see you today as we celebrate Palm Sunday together. Uh, there are a couple things I want to share with you as we get started today. First of all, as one of our local partner ministries, the Samaritan House is in need of juice bottles uh, in regular size. It could be apple juice, grape juice, cranberry juice, whatever kind of juice you want to buy is fine. Uh, you can deliver it to them in person or you can bring it here to the church and we'll get it delivered for you, whichever you prefer. We just appreciate your being generous up front. Coming up also this week, there are a couple of activities I want to highlight for you. One of those is on Thursday. Our Monday Thursday service will be April the 14th at 6 p.m. We will gather in Maxwell Hall. And because we are participating and celebrating a meal together, it would be hugely helpful if you could RSVP uh, to give us an idea on the head count so we have enough food. So I uh, hope that we'll see you there on this coming up Thursday. And then also a quick rundown of our Easter Sunday schedule. Uh, the 17th of April, we'll have 10 o'clock adult Sunday school, 1045 our children's worship as usually scheduled. Uh, also as usual, our 11 o'clock service with lunch at noon. And then at 1245-ish, will be our Easter egg hunt. And I say is, it may be 1230 or 1245 or 1250. This depends on how the day goes there. Also, just a quick reminder on that Sunday for lunch, we will not, repeat, not have fried chicken and baked chicken that day. Um, our local chicken provider is closed on that day. So we'll do hams instead um, and would also love for you to bring a couple of extra uh, dishes or just a little more extra uh, as we normally have a larger crowd on Easter Sunday there for lunch. And then last but not least, if you are inclined to contribute financially in any way, uh, the best way is to do that if you're not here in person with us is to send your contributions to the Church Let Cherokee PO Box 3327 Longview, Texas 75606 or hit the church website, churchletcherokee.com, find the donate button and go through the details from there. Hey, we're glad that you are joining us as we begin a holy week in celebration of all that our Savior has done, is done, and will do for all of us forever. We thank you for joining us during this time of Holy Week. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah Louder than the unbelief I raise a hallelujah My weapon is a melody I raise a hallelujah Heaven comes to fight 
the 17th, Juna got his swing back. You have the right to call the game on account of darkness. That crowd will string us up by our thumbs if we don't finish. All right! Play will continue! This is when a man needs pals in the Mermaids Union. Hagen came back from the dead. Let me get a smoke. I want you to tell Speck to hold the flag in case I make it. They'll love that. I want a three iron. Get my shoes. Hey, what's going on? Hey, you want Speck to hold the flag for him in case he sinks it. I'm going to miss playing Walden. It moved. I have to call a stroke on myself. No! No! Don't do it! Please don't do it! Only you and me seen it, and I won't tell a soul. Cross my heart. Ain't nobody gonna know. I will, Hardy. And so will you. Tell him not to do it, beggar. It's just a stupid rule that don't mean nothing. That's a choice for Mr. Juniper, Hardy. No one wanted the penalty assessed. Not even Jones and Hagen. This was no way to win a match. Maybe you're mistaken, Juniper. Maybe it moved before you touched your impediment. Might not have moved at all. The light plays funny tricks this time of day. 
A ball is deemed to have moved if it leaves its original position in the least degree, but not if it merely oscillates and comes to rest in its original position. Is she different? Can you be certain? Sometimes a ball will shudder and then settle back again, Jamie. The ball was here, and it rolled to here. Hit it quick, old boy, before you have time to think about it. You're leaving. Yes, sir. Yes, I am. I need you. No. No, you don't. Not no more. There's a small matter, around about five dollars. It was guaranteed. Yes, it was. Spec you won't be needing these shoes back now, yeah. You know, I done broke them in them foot and all, you know. Thank you, sir. This man is yours, Hardy. Take him on in. You want me to take over for you? You leaving me? Only for a little while. You pick up Mr. Juno bag. You towed it real straight now, yeah? But what if something comes up? And I don't know what to do. Well, I got a feeling you figured out. But I'll be seeing you. Another scene from our movie entitled The Legend of Bagger Vance. We'll get to that scene there in just a, a moment there. Uh, we're, it's great that we're looking at that scene and, and doing that on, on what is Palm Sunday. Um, and we're going to put those two together in our scripture reading. And you'll kind of see in a few minutes why this is such a great day to, to be looking at that scene and, and hitting our topic for today. Uh, I, I got a question for you as we get started. And you're just a brief question. Uh, and here it is. How consistent am I... Or, or how consistent are you? How consistent am I at what I say I believe and the way I actually live? Do I actually live according to the things I say that I believe, the things that I say that are important? How much, how much consistency is there? How much integrity is there between what I say I believe versus what I actually do? But that's going to be sort of the topic that we talk about this morning in our movie clip as well as our scripture reading here on Palm Sunday. For our scripture, we're going to be in the Gospel of Luke. Luke is one of the four gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Uh, each of them telling Jesus' birth and life and ministry and death and resurrection, but doing it a little bit differently, sharing a little bit different stories from different perspectives, uh, knowing that they were writing their stories uh, to different audiences. So there are some differences, and one of those differences we're going to look at today as we see the story of Palm Sunday and Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. So here we go. Let's check out Luke's version of that here this morning. And when he had said these things, talking about Jesus, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. And when he drew near to Beth. Page and Bethany at the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of his disciples saying to them, go into the village in front of you where on entering you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever yet sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you why are you untying it, you shall say this, the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent away and found it just as he had told them, and as they were untying the colt, its owners said to them, Why are you untying the colt? 
And they said, the Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus and throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the ground. And as he was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all of the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. And Jesus answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. The great part there at the end, that even if they were silent, the stones will cry out. We'll we'll tackle that on another Palm Sunday as we look at that sort of part of the scripture. Today we're looking at and asking ourselves the question, how, how, how consistent am I? How much integrity do I have between what I say I believe versus what I actually do and the way I actually live? You see, in this version of, of the Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem, see, Jesus knows this is the last time he will enter the city. He knows this is the ending of his ministry. He knows he comes into Jerusalem to surrender his life on the cross, to be put to death and be resurrected through the power of God. He knows that's what time it is. Although the disciples, they don't obviously know that yet. And, and so as he comes in, as Luke shares his telling of this story, It is a celebration, but it is a celebration of Jesus' disciples as to who they say and who they believe that Jesus is. This is not the version where the great crowds are there chanting their hosannas and then on Thursday are chanting, hey, crucify him, crucify him. That's not the story that Luke shares with us. Luke shares with us and focuses on his disciples being the ones who are proclaiming who Jesus is because of the mighty works that they have seen. I mean, his disciples have been with him the longest. They've seen the most. They've traveled the farthest. They've heard all the teachings. They've seen the miracles. They've asked the questions. They've been given the answers. I mean, these are the people who know Jesus best. And while it's not, they don't know him completely, they know him better than anyone else. And so it gives them cause. It gives them reason to celebrate works that they have seen. Our movie, uh, the, the Legend of Bagger Vance, that's a great scene. It takes place at the end of the movie. The matches come all the way down to the very last hole. And all three of the golfers are tied. Whoever wins the hole wins the whole match and wins the $10,000 prize that goes to first place. My, how, how much golf has changed over the years because they win a, a few dollars more than that now if you win a tournament. But, but as they're in the, the match, they're, in the, they're hitting their shots, there comes a moment where you discover that the character of Randolph Juna has to decide how much he actually believes what he says he believes. And is he going to live by what he says he believes? You you see, the game of golf, if you've never played the game of golf, the game of golf has like tons and tons of rules. I mean, you, you thought the Bible had lots of rules in there? Man, the Bible's got nothing on the game of golf. The game of golf has got lots and lots and lots of rules. And some of the rules make total sense. Some of the rules seem pretty obvious, but then there are some of those rules, let us just say, make no sense at all. Dare I say, even almost sound a little bit stupid. Like, why is that there? Why, what is the whole point of that? Uh, yet, yet it's one of the rules of the game of golf. And, and, and unlike most other sports, when it comes to the game of golf, the participants in golf oftentimes call penalties on themselves. You you see it in the film clip. The ball moves from one place to the next because the character moved a a piece of it, and that becomes a penalty. That is an infraction, and he actually calls that on himself because he so values the honesty of the game, he so values the integrity of the game to play by the rules that are there 
that he calls the penalty on himself. Now, let me ask you a question. When was the last time watching any other major sporting event that you ever saw a player, male or female, college or professional, actually call a foul or a penalty on themselves? <laughs> yeah, I'll wait for you because you might be a minute. Now, now, look, some of the people raise their hand. Yep, I, it was me. That's after it's already been called. But, but no one ever goes up and says, hey, hey, you know what? On that, that player, I actually, I actually held him back there. Or, her, hey, back there, I actually shoved her out of bounds. It was my fault. It was a penalty on me. No one ever calls the fouls on themselves. In fact, it's the actual opposite. I mean, you can be watching a game of football, and the guy literally has the other player's helmet in it, on his hand. And he's like, no, no, I didn't, I didn't hold it. I didn't grab his face mask. Or you'll see in basketball, somebody just plow somebody over. Well, I did the game of golf. That's not generally how the participants participate. They're actually left to themselves to enforce the rules because most of the time when you're playing the game of golf, you're out on your own or you're at least away from the people that you're playing with. And oftentimes the rules and fractions that happen, you're the only one that actually might know it. Or you might be the only one that knows you are intentionally breaking the rules. You're left to police yourself to see how much integrity, how much consistency there is between honoring the game itself and playing by the rules. We've all, and folks of us who play golf all know of folks who have bent the rules at times. I used to play with somebody, you know, and they would, they would always eat lifesavers, which we thought always sort of was an odd thing, the lifesaver thing. But the life, he'd say, oh, y'all go on, I'll hit and I'll catch up. Well, he would take the lifesaver and throw it on the ground and roll the ball up on top of it and hit it, which is in essence teeing it up and improving your life, which of course is against the rules. And it took us for a while to figure out he wasn't eating the lifesavers for the lifesavers. He was using them to cheat at the game of golf. Or when you get down with a hole and you write down the scores and you say, hey, so-and-so, what would you get? And they go, uh, I had a five. And you're thinking, five? You were one off the tee, two in the woods, three by the sand trap, four in the water, five out, on and six. You three put it. That's nine. How would you get five? Oh, I had five. <laughs> and you're like, okay, whatever. <laughs> just, I'm just going by the, by the numbers I've been given. And you, you know it's not accurate, but oftentimes that's how it gets done. Folks that don't work by or play by have the consistency and the integrity of playing by the rules that are there. Much like golf, our lives of faith give us opportunities most on an everyday basis to demonstrate just what we say we believe. Do our actions validate what we say that we actually believe? believe is there some consistency in what we say we believe and actually the way that we live out our lives because just like in the game of golf oftentimes oftentimes you and i as we live are left to ourselves because no one's necessarily around no one's actually watching nobody's actually scrutinizing every single thing that we do say we know ourselves. Is there consistency? Is there integrity between what I say I believe versus what I actually am doing? And this is a great thought to entertain ourselves or, or question to ask ourselves on Palm Sunday. Because it lets us focus on the disciples for a minute. The guys who knew Jesus the best, who traveled the farthest, who heard the most, they come into the city proclaiming who he is, celebrating his presence because of all the mighty works they had done. So they clearly are making it clear what they believe and what they say about Jesus and what they believe about who he is and what he's done. But here's a question. As the week unfolds and as Jesus is arrested and put on trial... Where are the disciples at that point in time? Well, where, where do they actually go? <laughs> well, if you've read through the story and know much about it, you know that they actually all basically run for their lives. I mean, when Jesus gets arrested, they all like just flee. They flee the scene. They're gone. They're taking care of themselves. I mean, and, and, you know, and Peter, and Peter of all the guys, I mean, Peter's actually even confronted by someone who, who believes that he is a follower of Jesus, that he's one of his disciples. And, and Peter, when asked, are you one of Jesus' disciples? Not once, not twice, but three times actually says, no, you got the wrong guy. I don't know him. I wasn't even there. 
And you go, man, really? You see, part of what we have to give ourselves some thought is that it is so valuable for us to actually live by what we say we believe. But we're not looking for perfection. We're not going to always do the right thing. We're not going to always have the right answer. We're not going to always get it right. Because even the disciples, in moments of stress, gave in to the fear and made choices that were not consistent with what they said they believed about who Jesus was. But they got past those moments of failure and mistake, just the way you and I can get past those moments of failure and mistake. You you see, the point is to actually live our lives in such a way that we are, with the best of our intention, the best of our ability, trying to live by what we say we believe, knowing that we're going to have mistakes. But this story reminds us that, hey, even the disciples made mistakes, but they moved past them. And it was making the mistakes, didn't kick them out of the community, didn't put them beyond God's ability to use them in some way. Because Peter, even though he denied Jesus three times, goes on past this moment to be one of the pillars of the early church. The other disciples who all ran for their lives. Guys like John and Andrew and Simon and Thaddeus and Bartholomew, all these guys who run for their lives actually get past their moment of failure and their dumbness of doubt. And they go on to help lead and help create and help grow the early church. And they live their lives so passionately by what they believe in who Jesus is and by what Jesus has done, primarily his resurrection. They live so passionately based on that belief that many of them are put to death because their actions so backed up what they said they believed. They had so much consistency and integrity in the things that they said they believed and the way they actually lived, they were put to death. Now, I'm not suggesting necessarily you live in such a way that you're put to death, but it gives us a moment to ask ourselves, how consistently am I living by what I say I believe? When it comes to things like when I say you, I, I believe in the sanctity of marriage, well, well, am I living my life in such a way that I'm respecting and honoring my spouse, spouse and remaining faithful and sticking to the commitments and the promises I made to uphold the marriage that I'm a part of? Well, when it comes to, I look at other people and go, yeah, I know everybody's created in God's image and everybody's a child of God. Well, really, then when I see other people, even the people I don't like, even the people who ridicule and make fun of me, do I treat them in such a way that reflects, I believe that they are created in the image of God just like I am and that they are so valuable and so worthy to God that his son died for them just like he died for me? Do I treat others based on that? belief. When it comes to community of faith, if I say I believe the community of faith is valuable and it's important and it's healthy to be a part of, well, am I consistently a part of the community of faith? Am I protecting the community of faith? Am I inviting and bringing others into the community of faith because I find it so valuable in my own life that I want to share that with others? When it comes to the preciousness and the sanctity of life, do I live my life in such a way that I am a protector of life itself. How consistently am I living by what I say I believe? I I say I believe the importance of family. Really? Then does family occupy itself with the highest list of my priorities? If, If I say family is important and family is valuable, then does my actions and the way I schedule my time and my activities and everything I've got, does it reflect that family is that important by the way that I actually live? And if I say I value God's grace and God's mercy and God's forgiveness because I know I am in need of that, do I live my life in such a way where I am gracious and merciful and forgiving of others? How consistent am I in living? by what I say I believe. On our golf clip, he was left to himself. No one else saw it other than the young boy with him. 
No one else knew it had happened. No one else really even wanted the rules and fraction to be called. But he knew himself that it was a penalty. And he knew that he was going to have to live with his decision to hide the penalty or call the penalty. He was going to have to live with the consistency or the insistency of living by what he said he believed in. And, of course, chose to call the penalty on himself. You and I, as we live our lives, we're oftentimes, even though we're part of families and part of communities of faith, we're going to live our lives in such a way that we're out there and we're kind of on our own. And no one's really going to know. No one else is necessarily always going to see. Am I living by what I say I believe? Is there consistency? And is there integrity there? May each of us be like the disciples who certainly understand who Jesus is, who make the confessions about who he is in our lives, who have seen all the mighty works that he has done, yet still every now and then make mistakes and have moments of failure, but live lives in such a way that there is integrity and consistency in what we say and what we believe and that we live it in such a way that all of those around us, literally the world itself, is impacted. May we live lives just like that. Amen. God of creation There at the start Before the beginning of time With no point of reference You spoke to the dark And fleshed out the wonder of life And as you speak A hundred billion galaxies are born In the vapor of your breath The planets form And if the stars were made to worship so light I can see your heart in it Every burning star signal fire grace And if creation sings your praises so alive Got a canvas of you.
my heart through all of my failure and pride. On a hill you created, the light of the world, abandoned in darkness to die. And as you speak, a hundred billion failures disappear. Well, you lost your life so I could find it here. And if you left the grave behind you, so Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself. And when we have fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you and your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. When he gave him thanks to you, he broke it gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink of it, do this for the remembrance of me. Take these gifts, O Lord, and sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in Him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The gifts of God for the people of God, take them in remembrance that Christ died for you, 
and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. Now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ keep you in everlasting life. Will you please join me in our unison prayer? Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food and the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and the love of God and of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. With my hands held high The valley will never take my song Find me in the desert Holding on to you for life The desert will never take my song Oh, the desert will never take my song I will praise you Where you prophesy, still shout of everything you've done. High up on the mountain, I was made to testify. Forever, you will have my song. Oh, forever, you will have my song. The more I'll...